Great. Thanks so much for having me. I, a phenomenal first couple of talks there. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about how these concepts apply to deformity and my experience in deformity. Um, I don't have any um, disclosures that are relevant other than we participated also in that um, SI bone study called Sylvia, which I'll talk a little bit about in this talk um, and got some research grant to do that. So um, <clears throat> background here for deformity is that, you know, pelvic fixation, pelvic screws are such a comfort blanket for degenerative and deformity surgeons. Um, whenever I have problems at the 5-1 joint or I have a big, long, stiff fusion, um, it just gives me this sense of security to put these big, long 100 millimeter, 9, 10 millimeter screws in. But, um, you know, there's a reason there's a reason we feel that way, right? Because that, the, you know, these pelvic fixation screws have have really helped us fix a lot of revision scenarios. And they've also really reduced the 5-1 pseudo rate in long deformity. Um, but, you know, what's hidden underneath that cup comfort blanket is that these screws actually have a surprisingly high incidence of failure. And I'm not painting them as a as a as a bad thing necessarily, but I think what people need to know is that they do fail, they do loosen, and they do cause SI joint dysfunction. Um, furthermore, S2 AI screws, and you know, obviously they're going across the SI joint, they do not result in SI joint fusion. Um, one, one recent study showed a 0% arthrodesis rate and actually accompanied with 45% SI joint pain. So that's sort of a, a negative categorization of these of this of this very comforting uh, useful fixation technique. So what's so the purpose of this talk is to kind of talk a little bit more about why that might be and what some of the implications are. Um, interest has really arisen, you know, in adding fusion devices to S two AI screws in order to protect the S two AI screws, prevent pelvic screw failure. And really, if we could just get the SI joint, fu uh, joint to fuse, then maybe we eliminate a lot of that SI joint dysfunction and deformity. Um, you know, the, the incidence of that SI joint dysfunction, obviously there's issues with diagnosis, but it's pretty high. It's, it's reported from 10 to 33% in uh, most of the more recent studies. And then when we look at iliac screw fixation failure and standard deformities without SI joint fusion, um, we, we have a, a similarly alarming rate of S of iliac screw failure. So um, a multi-center group recently, this is very recent, this came out this year, um, which we were a part of, sort of gathered a, a cohort of over 700 cases to just look at what happens with the, SI, with the pelvic screw failure. And again, this is no SI joint fusion. This is just deformity cases with S2AIs and pelvic bolts. 5% acute failure within six months of the sur index surgery. Um, the majority of them are rod slipping or a cap popping off, but there's definitely some shank fractures and some loosening. Um, when you do an inner body at L5S1, or you use big long screws, or you use multiple screws, or you use multiple rods, you obviously protect those screws from failing. And I think a lot of that's pretty intuitive. Um, an independent risk factor for screw failure is just a large pre-op deformity. The more, the more you're correcting and the more stress you're putting on that pelvic base, the more likely are the screws are to fail. And there was actually one specific implant manufacturer, which you can email me about after my talk, um, if you want to know, um, uh, that was identified as a risk factor. So what else do we know? What, 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 how about some more background here? Um, you know, we, we know that I guess I, what I want to communicate with this slide is that we have to think about the SI joint and, and the other speakers alluded to this. We have to speak about the SI joint as an adjacent segment. You know, most of us historically have just considered L5S1 the last adjacent segment. Once that's gone, once it's fused, once it's stable, you're done. It's probably not the case. The SI joint is a real joint. The motion isn't comparable, but it really does. It really is an adjacent segment. And so this data kind of makes sense, you know, degenerative patients that have stiffened lumbar spines actually see increased motion at the SI joint. Dubasse um, recognized that an intact mobile SI joint was actually important for his achievement of arthrodesis in deformity patients. So this is a picture of one of his base of deformity screws, um, which is kind of like not really a screw that's used much anymore. 
but it's an iliosacral screw that doesn't go across the joint. It like stabilizes the segment and provides a base without providing arthrodesis. So he sort of recognized that a mobile adjacent segment at the SI joint um, leads to better fusion rates, which I think is pretty astounding considering that we're still talking about it in 2023. So what do we know about biomechanics here? I, I want to go through a couple papers. Um, this is a, a, a neat um, cadaver study that compared an intact specimen, S1 and S2 Ehler screws without SI joint fusion, or crossing rather, um, iliac screws without SI joint crossing, and S2 AI screws. So as expected, the more fixation you put that's not across the SI joint, the more the SI joint is going to move. So that's kind of intuitive. Um, it's it's your adjacent segment. Um, when you put SI, S2 AI screws across the SI joint, you reduce some motion at the SI joint, but not much. 75 to 80% of the motion still remains. So I think that's kind of striking that these S2 AI joint screw, these S2 AI screws do not limit motion at the SI joint. And then when you look at actual implants to try to fuse the SI joint in comparison to what happens with just a standard S2 AI screw, it's pretty clear that like putting three dowel implants in limits the motion of the SI joint much more than just putting a single screw over it. So multiple points of fixation. That, I think that's pretty intuitive as well. Now, when we this is kind of a more modern approach, and and Jed uh, referred to it. Um, when we have an S2 AI screw and then we add a dowel, a fusion dowel, in addition to that screw, we probably protect the S2 AI screw from failure, which makes sense. We're just adding fixation across that same corridor. But the more robust you make that SI joint, the more you increase rod strain. And actually, just the two points of fixation don't, which is kind of, I thought this was kind of interesting. The two points of fixation don't really limit S2 AI or, or don't really limit SI joint motion. But maybe that's because this is a cadaver and we don't have the opportunity for, for arthrodesis stability. So this is just like a static, two static implants put in don't really limit the motion compared to S2 AIs alone. So it's just some interesting biomechanic data that, that tells me S2 AIs don't limit SI joint motion and don't cause a fusion. And then using the SI joint implants to stiffen up the SI joint and really remove that motion, it probably protects the S2 AI screws, but it gets us thinking, hey, if we see higher rod strain at L5S1, what about the other adjacent segments? And I'm getting into that uh, in a second. So before I do, I wanted to just go over kind of a how we can possibly fuse the SI joint if that's your goal. And I'm not sure that should be our goal at least in deformity, um, and I'm going to talk about that. But if you want to do it, you can just burr out the joint because you're already open. You can actually expose the joint and, and, and burr it and pack it. Um, certainly, you can use percutaneous transiliac um, fixation devices, which have been talked about already. We can use these S1. I call them S1A1 because they're sort of placed, um, and I'll show you some pictures, but they're sort of placed just above the S2 AI screw, sort of from the S1 Ailer segment across the SI joint. And then we can consider actual, rather than dowels, we can do some combination implant where, where it's sort of like a fusion screw that might core out some bone and, and try to achieve some fusion, but it also has a tulip head, so it acts like a screw. So this is what I mean about the, and this this is a similar picture to what was shown earlier. We we place the S two AI screw and we put a dowel um, to accompany it to actually go for a fusion. And this is one of the first papers to report on the results. They did forty two navigated insertions and you had they had three malposition events even under navigation that were corrected um, because they were recognized and corrected. Um, the screws are pretty easy to put in under navigation. My experience participating in the Sylvia study, the SI bone study, is that these dowels are really, really straightforward, especially if you've got navigation up and running um, to place. And just a technical note, you know, if you put your S2 AI screw on this picture on the right, if you put your S2 AI screw in the middle of the teardrop, you leave yourself very little room for the dowel. So we try to put the S2 AI a little lower in the teardrop, and then it gives us plenty of room to put the dowel in. 
And this is this is one of these combination implants. There's a couple companies that make these. I don't have any conflicts with them. Um, but this is like you know a coring sort of ingrowth 3D printed device with a tulip head, so you can just use that. I would submit that this might cause a little local fusion, but one point of fixation probably doesn't cause a robust SI joint fusion. So I'm going to finish with just talking a little bit about sort of what we know and what we don't know about the implications of actually achieving a fusion at the SI joint and deformity. Um, just to take a step back, we know that when we do a, a big, long, stiff construct, actually this this sort of goes against dogma the the pelvic incidence which really just describes how the sacrum is set in the pelvis it shouldn't be a changeable value but we know that when we create this big stiff lever arm um, with t10 to pelvis or whatever deformity operation you're doing um, the pelvic incidence does change and again this is an adjacent segment okay so we have to think about it like that if you do get an SI joint fusion, and this is a finite element study, what's the adjacent segment after the SI joint? Well, it's the hip. So this is what we have to kind of think of at this point when we're trying to get a, a robust fusion across the SI joint and the rest of the spine is fused as well. So there's paper after paper that have come out recently talking about this, th this notion of if you fuse the SI joint and you're in deformity setting, maybe the hip is actually your next adjacent segment. So very intriguing. I, I think that with more robust sacropelvic immobility, meaning you really try for an SI joint fusion in the setting of deformity and you get it to stop moving, um, maybe your hip joint disease accelerates um, both in native hips or reconstructed hips. Perhaps there's... Um, instability issues we need to think about. And this is totally unknown. So this is this is areas for future study. Um, furthermore, the, the, the thing that plagues us so much, and we don't have a good solution to, is that going to get worse when we do this intervention, when we get a robust SI joint fusion? Is my PJF, uh, my acute failure of that upper instrument of vertebrae or, or UIV type plus one, is that going to get worse? And then are we going to start seeing new patterns of sacral insufficiency fractures? loss of, you know, maybe that, maybe when you do a big deformity case, you really need that SI joint flexibility to accommodate a pelvic incidence change. Um, maybe you lose that ability and what implications does that have? So um, I'm really, the, you know, the data hasn't been published on the Sylvia study, um, which is again, the, the, the dowel plus an S2AI screw, prospective randomized, very, very robust design as SI bone is known for. Um, and again, I have no conflict with them, but we're all pretty excited to see what the longer term data from this study shows, because I think we're going to see, and it needs to be looked at critically, I think we're going to see some unintended consequences of taking this approach, and 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 we really need to, to hash that out. So um, in summary, you know, SI fusion implants in the setting of deformity seem like they protect the S2AI and pelvic screws. Um, it seems like they'll prevent some of the acute failure and they may they may present some pelvic uh, some SI joint dysfunction um, there's a variety of ways you can try to go for an SI joint fusion but I would I think the the best data is for multiple points of fixation and true fusion implants 